Today's topic of discussion is mandibular movements. A thorough knowledge about the various movements of the mandible is essential before recording the jaw relation. Mandibular movements occur around the temporomandibular joint which is capable of making complex movements. The maxillary mandibular relationship varies every second during mandibular movements. So prior to understanding the concept of mandibular movements, let's first brush up our knowledge on the temporomandibular joint. The temporomandibular joint has a capsule and an articulating disc. The glenoid fossa, the temporal bone and the condyle of the mandible form the articulating surfaces. The joint cavity is divided into the upper and lower compartments by the articular disc. The terminal portion of the articular disc forms the retrodiscal tissue. The bounding structures are the articular eminence in the anterior region and the external auditory meatus in the posterior region. Lateral pterygoid is a major muscle which is attached to the condyle. We shall discuss about the muscles of mastication attached to the mandible in subsequent slides. The temporomandibular joint is a bilateral, diarthroidal, synovial hinge and a compound joint. So what does all these terms mean? We shall look at it one by one. So bilateral as the name indicates, it's obvious that there are two joints. So one on the right side, one on the left side. So TMJ is present in pair. Diarthroidal means that the joint can make free movements in various planes. Synovial indicates a joint cavity which contains synovial fluid. It's a lubricating fluid present between the joints. Hinge movement is associated with rotation of the mandible. As such, the mandible can make two types of movements. Rotation, that is the hinge movement, and translation, that is gliding movement. And it is a compound joint. Compound meaning that it is a joint with more than two bones articulating. So we already talked about the glenoid force of the temporal bone. So the temporal bone is one bone which is involved and the condyle, the second bone involved. Whereas the third bone involved is the articular disc. So the articular disc acts like the third bone and each compartment that is the superior and the inferior compartment acts as a separate joint during function. So as mentioned before, the temporomandibular joint exhibits two types of movements namely rotation or hinge movement and translation or gliding movement. The upper compartment shows anterior posterior gliding movement. When this movement takes place, the condyle and the disc move as a single unit against the glenoid fossa. Whereas the lower compartment shows hinge movement. During hinge movement, the condyle moves against the articular disc and the glenoid fossa, which together act as a single unit. The slope of the glenoid fossa is not straight. Instead, it is a, an S-shaped bend. Hence, the condyle also moves along an S-shaped path. This shape of the glenoid fossa, which determines the path of movement of the condyle, is called the, the condylar guidance. Determinants of mandibular movements. The major factors that determine the mandibular movements in general are condylar guidance, incisal guidance, and neuromuscular factors. Condylar guidance is also known as the posterior determinant. It can be defined as mandibular guidance generated by the condyle and articular disc traversing the contour of the glenoid fossa. So it's nothing but the path of movement taken by the condyle in the glenoid fossa. It is measured using a protrusive interocclusal record. The next one is incisal guidance, which is the anterior determinant. It is the influence of the contacting surfaces of the mandibular and maxillary anterior teeth during mandibular movements. The lingual surface of the maxillary anteriors guide the mandible during protrusive movement, and this is known as the incisal guidance. It is absent in case of completely edentulous patients and it needs to be reproduced in complete dentures arbitrarily. And the third factor being neuromuscular factors. The muscles of mastication are the most important determinants of mandibular movements. And similarly, the tone of the muscle also determines the freedom of movement. The muscles of mastications are namely the temporalis, lateral pterygoid, medial pterygoid and buccinator. The lateral pterygoid controls protrusion. The medial pterygoid and the meseta control the lateral movements and the temporalis controls retraction and closure of the mandible. Based on the extent of movement, mandibular movements can be classified as border and intraborder movements. Border movement is defined as mandibular movement and the limits dictated by anatomic structures as viewed in a given plane. So as the definition suggests, border movements are recorded in three different planes, which are extreme movements in the horizontal plane, which produces a characteristic diamond tracing, extreme movements in the sagittal plane, which produces a characteristic beak tracing, 
while recording the border movements. Extreme movements in the coronal plane, border movements produced in this plane produce a characteristic shield tracing and an envelope of motion. That is, when we combine the border movements of all the three plates, we get a three-dimensional space within which mandibular movements is possible. And this three-dimensional limiting space is called as the envelope of motion. So now we shall discuss it one by one. The horizontal plane, the transverse plane or the axial plane, which is also known as horizontal plane or the transaxial plane, it's an imaginary plane that divides the body into superior and inferior parts. It is perpendicular to the coronal plane and the sagittal plane. Now, the horizontal axis or the transverse axis runs horizontally from the right side of the mandible to the left side. Rotation around this axis is seen during protrusive movements. The transverse axis of rotation varies during different phases of protrusive movement. During initial mouth opening, the transverse axis passes through the head of the condyle, whereas during the later stages of mouth opening, the transverse axis passes through the mandibular foramen. So now let's look at the border movements in horizontal plane. As already stated, the border movements recorded in the horizontal plane produce a characteristic diamond tracing. While recording the tracing, the patient is first instructed to move his mandible to the centric relation position and then to centric occlusion. So centric relation is a relation of the TMJ, whereas centric occlusion is the occlusion of the teeth when the mandible is in the centric relation. Then the patient is instructed to bring his mandible forward in an edge to edge relationship guided by the incisal guidance. Following that, the patient should move the mandible to the maximum right lateral position and then to the maximum protrusion and then to the maximum left lateral position and gradually return to the centric position. An arrow point tracing formed using gothic arch tracers in a pantograph should and will coincide with this pattern of a diamond shape. The next dimension that we would be talking is the sagittal plane, which is the vertical plane that divides the face into the right and the left halves. The sagittal axis is an anterior posterior axis. The mandible shows slight rotation around this axis. During the movement, the condyle on one side moves downward and medially along the slope of the entoglenoid process, that is the medial slope of the glenoid fossa, and the condyle of the opposite side moves upward and laterally. This type of movement is usually seen in association with lateral movements. A characteristic beak tracing is formed while recording border movements in the sagittal plane. So the patient is first instructed to move the mandible from centric relation that is centric relation as already stated is the relation when the mandibular condyles are in the most superior and retruded position in the glenoid fossa with the articular disc properly interposed. It's a purely rotary movement around the transverse horizontal axis. We have already talked about uh, centric relation, centric occlusion and maximum intercuspation in previous presentations. So just have a look. So from the centric relation, the patient should move the mandible to centric occlusion. Centric occlusion is the occlusion of opposing teeth when the mandible is at centric relation. From that position, the patient is guided to move the mandible to an edge-to-edge -edge relationship, which is guided by the incisal guidance, and progress further forward to the maximum protrusive position, and then arc downward to the maximum mouth opening, that is MMO position. Once this position is reached, the operator should guide the mandible backward and close the mouth. Now, while closing the mouth, two kinds of movements takes, takes place. While closing the mouth, the mandible arcs upwards, that is rotation after translation around the transverse axis, passing through the mandibular foramen. And consequently, the condyle translates back to the centric relation position where the mandible continues to arc upwards around the true hinge axis passing through the condyle. And now moving on to the third plane that is the coronal plane or the frontal plane. It is perpendicular to the ground and separates the anterior from the posterior, the front from the back and the ventral from the dorsal. The frontal axis or the vertical axis runs through the condyle and the posterior border of the ramus of the mandible. The mandible rotates around this vertical axis during the lateral movements. So if the patient moves his mandible towards the right, the vertical axis of rotation will pass through the right condyle and vice versa. Border movements in the coronal plane. Border movements produced in this plane produce a characteristic shield tracing. Here the patient is instructed to move his mandible from centric occlusion here the patient is instructed to move his mandible from centric occlusion 
to a canine guidance disseclusion on the right side which is termed as RD and then to the maximum right lateral position then arc downwards towards the maximum mouth opening position from this position the patient is instructed to arc upward to the maximum left lateral position then return medially to canine guided disseclusion on the left side termed as LD and then return to centric occlusion so now we saw the movement of the mandible in the three planes now talking about envelope of motion the envelope of motion was first described by Pozzel in 1952 when we combine the border movements of all the three planes we get a three-dimensional space within which mandibular movement is possible and this three-dimensional limiting space is called as the envelope of motion the envelope of motion is longest and widest superiorly and narrows down to a point near the maximum mouth opening position so as the jaw separation increases space for movement decreases to a zero at the maximum mouth opening position so this was all about the border movements in the horizontal plane sagittal plane coronal plane and the envelope of motion the small dotted circle oval shaped circles which we saw in all these tracings are the functional movements and we shall discuss it in subsequent presentations i hope you have liked this presentation please do like share comment and subscribe to the channel thank you